fantastic. We have hundreds of people in the room, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Joseph Bednarik. I am the co-publisher here at Copper Canyon Press, and I'm coming to you from my home uh, uh, in Port Townsend, Washington, which is the traditional lands and waters of the Sklalem and the Chemicum peoples. Um, if you ever visit Port Townsend, you are invited to watch to walk the Chichmahan Trail, uh, which tells some of the rich indigenous history of this area. And wherever you might be tonight, uh, we encourage you to learn about the indigenous history of your area, uh, because Jim Harrison, he certainly did, he was very interested in native cultures. And speaking of Jim Harrison, I had the great good fortune of serving as his poetry editor. Uh, and I wanna welcome you to this online book launch uh, in celebration of our newest book, Jim Harrison, Complete Poems. And with Jim's birthday uh, this Saturday, this event is a bit of a birthday party as well. Uh, so as we begin, I would just like to say that there is no Zoom room on planet Earth and I would rather be in right now than one that is focused uh, on Jim Harrison's poetry. Uh, and there's so many people who have helped along the way. Uh, first and foremost, if you are actually in a Zoom room or on a Facebook page seeing this event, you have Marissa Vito and Janine Armstrong to thank. They are the tech wizards who are making this whole shebang possible. So thank you very much, Marissa and Janine. Uh, also profound gratitude to the good folks at the National Endowment for the Arts and the Lannan Foundation. To our volunteer board of directors, past and present, each person who serves or who has ever served on our board loves poetry and they believe in Copper Canyon's nonprofit mission that poetry is vital to language and living. And I also wanna personally thank the hundreds and hundreds of people who support our ambitious and ongoing project called the Heart's Work, Jim Harrison's Poetic Legacy. Now Heart's Work is what Jim called his poetry. Uh, so that's what we are calling this multi-year, multi-book project. And when you get a copy of complete poems in your hand, I encourage you to uh, open the book to the back and to read the names of all the people who have donated because all these people, these human beings around the world are investors in Jim Harrison's poetic legacy. And from that list of hundreds, I would like to give voice to a few by name uh, who generously supported the heart's work from the very, very beginning. Uh, first and foremost, to Jim's immediate family, Mary, David, Anna, and Jamie, we thank you for entrusting your brother's and father's poetic legacy with Copper Canyon. And thank you also for being here tonight. Uh, also, Debbie and Dan Gerber, Jana Turiano and Peter Lewis, Gregory Orr, Will Blythe, Liesel and Hank Meyer, Larry Mobby and Lois Bailey, Will Hurst, whose glorious magazine Alta just published a special edition of Jim's last poems. I encourage you to hunt that one down. And a special shout out to the Evans family, Sarah Mel, Austin and John. Uh, John runs one of Jim's favorite independent bookstores, Lemuria Books in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, for promotional support, a deep bow of gratitude to Stephen Spencer for all of his work on curating the Jim Harrison Facebook page, uh, for his starred review and book list, for calling Complete Poems a landmark collection. I wanna personally thank Raul Nino. Uh, and in the spirit of Russell Chatham, a special shout out and thanks to Leigh Chatham who granted us permission to use her father's final painting, a final gorgeous and sublime painting as the front cover to complete poems. And finally, a huge thank you to Bruce S. Kahn. Uh, Bruce is one of the country's greatest book collectors. He has an incredible passion for Jim Harrison's work. Uh, and when we told Bruce that we had this dream, Bruce, we've got this dream of a multi-year project to secure and advance Jim's legacy as a poet, Bruce simply said, tell me how I can help. Now that, is a good friend. Thank you, Bruce. So this legacy project continues with tonight's program. Uh, tonight, we're all helping to celebrate and expand the readership for Jim's poetry by being present here today with his work. Uh, in the audience tonight, we have attendees from three different continents. Hello, Australia. Hello, Europe. <laughs> Hello, each country in North America. 
there's actually even a viewing party for this event in the historic Plaza Theater uh, in rural, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the Plaza Theater in rural Waitsburg in Eastern Washington State. Hello, Waitsburg. And in the audience tonight, we also have Jim's biographer. We have Jim's bibliographer. We have two filmmakers who are doing a documentary on Jim and the folks at Grove, uh, the publisher of Jim's fiction and nonfiction. All these people care deeply about Jim's legacy, his legacy as an artist and a writer, novelist and a poet. And please know that while tonight's event is the launch of a very specific book, it is also Copper Canyon's launch into the next phase of our Heart's Work project. And so for starters, we have actually already ordered the second printing of Complete Poems because reader demand for this book is so high. Um, that, that we did not expect and so soon, and we are incredibly grateful. Uh, we're also preparing an anniversary edition of the classic book that Jim co-wrote with Ted Kuzer, uh, Braided Creek, A Conversation in Poetry. Uh, that new edition is going to have an introduction by Naomi Shihab Nye. Uh, and of course, we are planning the paperback release of the individual volumes from the three volume set. So as you can see, we are incredibly passionate about Jim's work. We are always thinking toward that next project, always thinking how we can find new readers. Uh, and if you love Jim's work, and because you're here, I have a sense that you do, uh, I invite you to visit the Heart's Work section of the Copper Canyon Press website uh, and to make a donation to help us find and cultivate the next generation of readers of Jim's poetry. Uh, a link to the Heart's Work page is also gonna be placed in the chat section uh, tonight, and it'll be placed in there at a variety of times throughout the evening. Uh, one donor benefit that you can reserve tonight is a copy of the remaining limited edition box sets. Um, we've got about 80 of those sets left of a, a total of a 750 print run. Uh, and once those books are gone, they're gone. Uh, the next time you will see those will be in paperback. And shipping for those box sets, uh, that will happen in early 2022. And the shipping for the other donor benefits from tonight's reading, uh, they will be shipped as soon as humanly possible. So, and so here we are, all of us, hundreds of us, three continents all around the world. And when you open up the copy, your copy of Complete Poems uh, to the dedication page, you're gonna find these words dedicated to Linda King Harrison, Jamie Harrison Potenberg, Anna Harrison Hjortsberg, and Joyce Harrington Bailey. Now these women were the bedrock of Jim's life as a husband, as a father, and as a writer, and Linda especially. She was the person who read every poem and novel first, the person who was Jim's muse for almost 60 years and who truly made his life possible. Among all the beloved family and friends, she was his life, soul and his love. The book launch tonight of Jim Harrison, Complete Poems, is in special memory of Linda King Harrison. I didn't realize I was going to get so emotional, but there you go. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have served as Jim Harrison's poetry editor um, and having intimate contact with Jim's poetry uh, was and continues to be just a sacred duty and joyful work. And since we're among friends here tonight at this book launch, I just want to share with you that I agree 1000% with Terry Tempest Williams when she writes in her introduction, quote, if writing poetry was Jim Harrison's spiritual practice, then reading his poetry can be a spiritual experience. Now for me, uh, Jim's poems have always provided nourishment of the highest order. Uh, I'm inspired by his drive to experience the genuine firsthand, or how, as the title of one of his poetry books indicates, he is in search of small gods. And one of the qualities that I most admire about Jim's poetry is how he reveals the sacred in the mundane. And one profoundly mundane object that populates Jim's poems throughout his life is stump, as in a tree stump. Now, while I haven't done an exhaustive study, I would bet that there are more tree stumps in Jim Harrison's body of work than any other American poet, probably 
all American poets combined. Now from his poem, Hospital, from his last book called Dead Man's Float, he is uh, writing a poem, long prose poem, uh, where he's suffering from an operation, from being cooped up, and he is desperate, desperate to leave the hospital, to get back outside, to get into a remote, gap, a remote gully in the upper peninsula of Michigan, and to return to his favorite stump. In that poem, uh, he calls this stump, quote, my place of grace on earth, my only church. Now just take that in for a moment. Near the end of his life, suffering in his physical body, Jim Harrison, the poet, proclaims that his only church is a stump. Now arcing back 50 years, as a young poet, stumps appear in four different poems in his debut volume, Plain Song, uh, including this short excerpt from Lyle's River. And that night, camped on a bluff, we ate eggs and ham and three small trout. We drank too much whiskey and pushed a burning stump down the bank. It cast hurling shadows, leaves silvered and darkened. The crash and hiss woke up a thousand birds. Now that is classic Harrison, classic themes, classic images just embedded in those five lines, being outdoors, the play of light and dark, moving water, drinking, pushing boundaries, birds, and of course, incredibly sharp observations. When we move to Jim's second book of poetry called Locations, we have the many, many stumps from his famous poem called Walking. They're the stumps that ignite memories of a dead father, stumps as a historical marker for the region, and a stump that serves as a blind for a young hunter. Here are nine lines from that long poem called Walking. Walking northwest two miles where another gully opened, seeing a stump on a knoll where my father stood one deer season and tiring of sleet and cold, burned a pine stump, the snow gathering fire orange on a dull day. Walking past charred stumps blackened by the 81 fire to a great hollow stump near a basswood swale, I sat within it on a November morning watching deer browse beyond my range of shotgun and slug chest beating hard for killing. Now I encourage you all to read the entirety of the poem walking aloud to feel the rhythm, to feel the rhythm, to feel the rhythm of that poem, to hear the incantation of the word walking, 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 and how Jim walks his way through woods, through meadows, through gullies, and through water, onto water, and into literally a mystical experience. Another very first book that Jim and I worked on together uh, was his new and collected poems called Shape of the Journey. And in that new poem section of that book, uh, Jim wrote about his favorite stump, that place of grace on earth, uh, his only church. So I'll close uh, my presentation with a poem from Geo Bestiary. And this is Geo Bestiary 16. My favorite stump straddles a gully a dozen miles from any human habitation. My eschatology includes scats, animal poop, scatology, so that when I nestle under this stump out of the rain, I see the scats of bear, bobcat, coyote. I won't say it that I feel at home under this vast white pine stump, the roots spread around me so large in places no arms could encircle them, as if you were under the body of a mythic spider, the thunder ratcheting the sky so that the earth hums beneath you. Here is a place to think about nothing, which is what I do. If the rain beats down hard enough, tiny creeks form behind my shit-strewn pile of sand. The coyote has been eating mice, the bear berries, the bobcat a rabbit. It's dry enough so it doesn't smell except for ancient wet wood and gravel, pine pitch, needles. Luckily, a sandhill crane nests nearby so that in June, if I doze, I'm awakened by her cracked and prehistoric cry, waking, startled, feeling the two million years I actually am. Now I can honestly say that I would rather go to that church, to that place of grace in a remote gully 
in the upper peninsula of Mission, Michigan than to any human-made construction. And if I asked Jim for directions to his stump, my guess is, is that he would say something like, best to walk around outside and find your own holy places, stumps and otherwise. And in fact, he calls us all to do this over and over and over again throughout his remarkable body of work. Please, when you get a chance, open up the complete poems and get ready to be marveled. So now I'd uh, like to pass the Zoom screen and the live mic to my friend, John Freeman. Uh, John is a poet, a critic, an executive editor at Knopf and founder of the literary journal Freeman's. Uh, Copper Canyon is the publisher of John's poetry uh, and his recent book, The Park, is highly recommended. Uh, Johnny, John has a brilliant literary mind uh, and we invited him to write an introduction to volume three of the limited edition box set. And as we expected, uh, John's insights into Jim's final four books of poems, they're just remarkable. Please, John Freeman. Joseph, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction of uh, Jim Harrison's poetry and for capturing the spirit of it in, uh, in, in so, so few words and picking out those beautiful poems. It's so nice to watch the chat roll down and see familiar places like Folsom, California, which is near where I'm from, as well as Singapore and New Zealand. Um, I once sat in a bar in Beijing, China, talking to a translator and I asked him what, who his favorite American poet was and without missing a beat, he said, Jim Harrison. And I've, I've had that experience in so many different places and unlikely places. I think partly because um, Jim Harrison had such a tangible appreciation for the vast and endless agency of nature, which I think all of us experience. And in many ways, he was the unfussy, unpretentious American word, Wordsworth who captured the, the, the feeling that nature can give to you when you see it as not an other, but yourself as part of it and go and meet many of the the pieces of wildlife on their own terms. Um, he really understood, I think, to some degree, too, the intermingling of species, how we are part animal, part human, part mythic creature. And he, he described this with a drama, um, which was uh, witchy and creaturely. Uh, I, I'm going to read his poem, The Bear, which um, you would think there might be 200 poems in Jim Harrison's oeuvre called The Bear, but um, this one I think is, is just extraordinary. When my propane ran out, when I was gone and the food thawed in the freezer, I grieved over the five pounds of melted squid. But then a big gaunt bear arrived and feasted on the garbage. A few tentacles left in the grass purplish white worms. Oh bear, now that you've tasted the ocean, I hope your dream life contains the whales I've seen. That one in the Humboldt current basking on the surface who seemed to watch the seabirds wheeling around her head. I think one of the joys of reading Jim Harrison's work is encountering all the different species that he seemed to be in consort with, watching not just the birds and bears, but all sorts of underwater creatures. I, I once, uh, in reading the complete poems to write my introduction to the last four books, I, I, I stopped writing down the, the various creatures of the world when it got to well over 250. Um, there's a rich specificity to that. Uh, which I think is also apparent in his poem, Birds Again, which I'll read now. A secret came a week ago, though I already knew it just beyond the bruised lips of consciousness. The very alive souls of 3,500 dead birds are harbored in my body. It's not uncomfortable, 
I'm only temporary habitat for these not quite weight, weightless creatures. I offered a wordless invitation and now they're roosting within me, recalling how I had watched them at night in fall and spring passing across earth moons, little clouds of black confetti chattering and singing on their way north or south. Now in my dreams, I see from the air, the rumpled green and beige, the watery face of earth as if they're carrying me rather than me carrying them. Next winter, I'll release them near the estuary west of Alvarado and south of Veracruz. I can see them perching on undiscovered Olmec heads. We'll say goodbye and I'll return my dreams to earth. There's a gentle kind of creaturely humor that laces through so many of his poems. Uh, he never was a purveyor of wisdom. He seemed to be its conduit, if at best it came to him. And I think that humbleness um, and his own acceptance of his own creaturely habits for his appetites, uh, I think it falls on us like a sort of tent of compassion. So when you read Jim Harrison's work, you feel accepted into your own habits, your own reaches, the, the multiplicities of selves that exist inside you. And I think that's what makes his work so companionable. Um, he's, it's not like just going on a walk with a particularly knowledgeable guide onto some marsh. Um, it's an inward walk uh, that he invites you to take with him. And because he had such a mastery of forms from guzzles to prose poems to lyrics, and because he was such a cosmopolitan poet and you know, he began under the wing of Neruda to some degree and, and read through all the Chinese great poets, uh, as well as Denise Levertov, who I think um, helped him along um, to find that first sound that became his voice across the 17 collections and 51 years that he was working as a poet. I think what, what happens is he sounds more and more like himself, which is such a profoundly beautiful journey to watch um, as a reader, but also as a poet. And he uh, allows you as a person, I think, to try to figure out what is, what is the sound that's calling from inside you. Um, one of my other favorite poems of his is called Mother Night. And I think he had an immense capacity um, to describe uh, just the sheer elements of the world. Uh, and all of us have woken in the middle of the night, um, but I think only Jim Harrison has described it in the way that it feels, um, the sort of stark shock of it. And then the, the, same, the strange feeling that you have upon waking where you're not even sure what it is you are, Mother Night. When you wake at 3 a.m., you don't think of your age or your sex and rarely your name or the plot of your life, which has never broken itself down into logical pieces. At 3 a.m., you have the gift of incomprehension, wherein the galaxies make more sense than your job or the government. Jesus at the well with Mary Magdalene is much more vivid than your car. You can clearly see the bear climb to heaven on a golden rope in the children's story no one ever wrote. Your childhood horse named June still stomps the ground for an apple. What is morning and what if it doesn't arrive? One morning, mother dropped an egg and asked me if God was the same species as we are. Smear of light at 5 a.m. Sound of Weber's sheep flock and sandhill cranes across the road. Verbal of irrigation ditch beneath my window. She said, only lunatics save newspapers and magazines. Fried me two eggs and said, if you want to understand mortality, look at birds. Blue moon, two full moons this month, which I conclude are two full moons. In what direction do the dead fly off the earth? Rising sun, a thousand blackbirds pronounced stay. Such an extraordinary capacity to make images all across his work. And I think one of the reasons why this book will push forward as, I don't know, the, the complete poems of Carl Sandburg did when it won the Pulitzer in 1953. And suddenly Sandburg was 
completely cemented as a classic American poet. I, I believe these poems together in this book will suddenly real, make people aware of the scale of uh, Jim Harrison's talent and the way it feels so alive. You can't come back to these poems and feel anything but alive in yourself because they activate the body. And they don't feel far away. They don't feel like they were written 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, you read these poems and it feels like someone's speaking to you uh, from right across the table. And that is just an extraordinary capacity for intimacy, uh, for myth, for using the mysterious capacities of color and music within sonics to, to make us all feel alive. I'm going to read one more poem um, and then hand it over. Um, I think, is, is it Amy? Are you next, Amy? Um, John, it, goes, no. it goes back to me, Joseph. Oh, I'll go back to Joseph. So if you'll indulge me one last poem. Um, he wrote a lot of poems about looking forward to old age. So I'm going to skip the one. <laughs> uh, but if you have any creaks in your bones, Jim Harrison is the poet for you because it, it makes growing old seem, even if it's painful, which it will be, um, a noble thing to do, but I would like to read another country. It's only eight lines. It has three periods. It has such perfect joinery within its syntax. It holds together like a Calder mobile. You have no idea how this poem stands up and yet it feels like it would withstand a tornado. I love these raw, moist dawns with a thousand birds you hear but can't quite see in the mist. My old alien body is a foreigner, struggling to get into another country. The loon call makes me shiver. Back at the cabin, I see a book, and I'm not quite sure what that is. The way that Harrison could estrange himself from himself and from the work that he was doing, and invite us in, into this magical kind of mythic process of using words on the page to weave a spell. Uh, it is a holy art. Uh, Joseph, I'm so honored that you chose me to come and read some of these poems um, and to be able to introduce some of the late work. It's, it's one of the great pleasures of the last two years. Um, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. John, thank you. Oh my God, that was so fantastic. I Nothing pleases me more than thinking about you out in the world with that hefty book in your lap and you just burrowing into those texts. And uh, you're so beautifully articulate about uh, poetry and about Jim's experience. I'm just absolutely delighted uh, that you're here with us tonight. So thank you very much. And Interestingly, Peter, or Peter, I'm sorry, John is the only person here who actually never met physically uh, Jim Harrison, but I feel like, John, you met him with such depth <laughs> that you have that sense. Uh, but now we have the great pleasure of uh, meeting and hearing from one of Jim's dearest friends, uh, Peter Lewis. Back in 1976, Peter uh, worked in Montana for the writer Richard Brodigan, and it's through Brodigan that Peter met Jim. And I love uh, thinking about that uh, interconnection. Uh, Peter eventually became a legendary restaurateur uh, in Seattle. Uh, and he also traveled with Jim to France on several occasions. And for those foodies uh, out there watching this evening, uh, Peter, yes, Peter was actually one of the people at the legendary 37 course lunch in France that Jim made famous in his New Yorker piece, A Really Big Lunch. Um, Jim's novels, Returning to Earth and The Big Seven, are both dedicated to Peter Lewis. And Peter, great pleasure to have you here with us. Thanks so much, Joseph. It's an honor being here with you and Amy and John and all of you to celebrate Copper Canyon's publication of this immaculate volume, Jim Harris and Complete Poems. I, I consider this the beating heart of Jim's poetic legacy project, The Heart's Work. Poetry at its best is the language your soul would speak if you could teach your soul to speak. Jim taught his soul to speak. 
He took his vows, accepted his vocation to become a poet at the age of 16. He read everything. He walked and wandered. He paid passionate and sensuous attention to the natural world and the human universe and kept writing. The gift of Jim's poetry traces the shape of his journey and we can follow him, accompany him, his passions, obsessions, observations, experiences, meditations, because he gave us a map of that journey, a map of his consciousness revealed in the poems he bequeathed to us. True, we have his novels, his novellas, his marvelous and miraculous essays, but it's only in his poetry, I think, that Jim Harrison laid his soul bare. In an interview conducted in 1997, Jim was asked the salient question, how do you describe the core, the spirit of your work? Harrison, this consciousness, I would say, otherness. Otherness to remind ourselves of the bedrock of life and death and love and suffering. Back to Lorca, what is poetry but love, suffering, and death. Poetry has the capacity to, to transcend death. Jim hung out with dead poets, beloved companions for over six decades, their voices and verses coming to him at odd moments, on walks, in the sound of wind rustling leaves and water breaking against shoals and shores, in birdsong, or the barking of his dogs, Keats, Valeri, Rilke, Rambeau, and Apollinaire in his youth, the Williams, Blake, and Wordsworth, Lorca, Neruda, and Machado, Walt Whitman, and Wallace Stevens, the Chinese poets of the Tang Dynasty, Ikkyu, Takahashi, Visenin, Akhmatova, and Mandelstam. As Jim wrote in the title poem of Saving Daylight, I'm enrolled in a school without visible teachers, the divine mumbling just out of earshot. In the last decade of his life, Jim declared his intention to make a series of pilgrimages to the graves of the poets who had most profoundly influenced him. He couldn't make it to China or Japan, Chile or back to Russia, but France and Spain were another story. I had the great privilege of joining him on several of these pilgrimages. The most significant and moving centered on the great Spanish poet, Antonio Machado. Jim was intent on finding the small satchel of Machado's last poems. Machado had to give up to relinquish as he crossed from Spain into France, fleeing Franco's phalangistas. He was only permitted to take one thing. And that thing happened, turned out to be his mother. They disembarked from a tiny little train. They were rounded up. They were put on a truck, sitting on benches. And he left the satchel beside, which may have been taken away from him. Nobody's entirely sure you can read about this in Willis Barnstone's wonderful introduction to Border of a Dream, another spectacular collection that Copper Canyon has published. He set the satchel on the ground and his mother who was ailing sat on his lap as they fled Spain, traveling into France and ended up in Collier. On his first attempt to find the lost satchel of Machado's poems, Jim had come up empty handed. On their second trip to Collier, he insisted on trying again. In November 2007, we convened on a cold, crystal clear morning, beautiful morning, in the courtyard of L'Hermitage de Notre Dame de Consolation, a 15th century retreat that had been converted into a hostel by Jim's winemaker friend, Christine Campadieu. Jimmy had noticed 
this stone, this giant flagstone in the courtyard. And he demanded that we move it aside so that he could explore the labyrinthine cave beneath the Hermitage. Christine found a bicyclist headlamp that somebody had left at the, at the hostel. Jim armed himself with his cane. And after, with extraordinary difficulty, we had dislodged the flagstone, he asked for the crowbar. He needed to defend himself if he was attacked by vipers. That's what he called the snakes he expected to encounter down underneath the hermitage. We lowered him through the opening. I'm not sure how we got him down there. A secret entrance to the cave after dislodging the flagstone. Jim searched for over an hour, could hear him, his voice fading as he wandered deeper into the chambers of the cellar. Nothing, nothing. And then finally, we couldn't hear him at all. He finally gave up. And if you think easing him down through the opening in the courtyard was tough, imagine what it was like pulling him out. He was moaning like a wounded beast. Why do they call this place our mother of consolation when I'm disconsolate that I can't find Machado's lost poems? I need some wine. We sat outside. Jim couldn't speak. He lit a cigarette and then another gulped red wine, and gazed out beyond the walls of the hermitage to the sea, invisible in the haze. A variation on Machado. I worry much about the suffering of Machado. I was only one when he carried his mother across the border from Spain to France in a rainstorm. She died, and so did he a few days later, in a rooming house along a dry canal. To carry mother, he abandoned a satchel holding his last few years of poetry. I've traveled to Collier several times to search for Machado's lost satchel. The French fed him, but couldn't save him. There's no true path for death. We discover the path by walking. We turn a corner on no road, and there's a house on a green hill with a thousand colorful birds sweeping in a circle. Are the poems in the basement of the house on the hill? We'll find out if we remember earth at all. The poem is testimony and testament to a poet's search. What is poetry but love, suffering, and death? We'll find out if we read Jim's poetry at all. And then we drove to Le Plan du Castellet to have lunch with Lulu Perrault at Domaine Templier. Jim and Lulu adored each other. I don't think they knew that they shared the same birthday, December 11th, 20 years apart. Templier's bandol really could be described as Jimmy's soul juice. After lunch, we made a short drive to Lumeran so that Jim could visit the grave of Albert Camus. It was Camus who wrote, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. Jim answered Camus' question in the final lines of the postscript to Letters to Today, you make me want to tie myself to a tree, stake my feet to earth herself so I can't get away. It didn't come as a burning bush or pillar of light, but I've decided to stay. He had no problem meditating over the diminutive headstone marking Camus' grave in Romarin. René Char was another matter. 
An interviewer once asked Jim, you quoted René Char as saying, lucidity is the wound closest to the sun. Will you speak to what it means for you and your work? And Harrison responded, your obligation as a writer is to be utterly vulnerable moment by moment by moment. It took us a while to locate the cemetery in ile sur la -Sur, but that was nothing compared to finding Char's grave. Harrison wanted to walk around and find it ourselves. How hard could it be after all? Small cemetery. Not that there was anyone to ask. The place was empty, not a grave digger, not a mourner. Only Jim and I searching for the grave of a beloved poet. Up and down one alley after another, then another. There were no signs, no maps, just headstones. In his poem, René Char and from In Search of Small Gods, Jim's concluding lines read, Char says that a poet is only to be there when the bread comes fresh from the oven. Isn't that wonderful? Jimmy used to say that. The wind picked up, started to drizzle. Jim finally gave up, raised the white flag and surrendered. He was hungry. As Jim once said, sometimes the only answer to death is lunch. It was a rainy Thursday morning on our last day in France. We needed to complete the mission Jim had set for himself, visits to the cemeteries of Montparnasse and Père Lachaise. We took our time. Paris the cemeteries are a wondrous death trip down the memory lane of French literature. Jean-Paul Sartre buried next to his lover and partner, Simone de Beauvoir, Julio Cortazar, de Maupassant, Samuel Beckett, Charles Baudelaire, Robert Desnos. When we came upon the grave of Marguerite Duras, it elicited a rapturous sigh about how much Jim loved the lover. When we found Cesar Vallejo's grave, Jim told a story that made it into his poem Weeks, collected in Dead Man's Float. The weeks rushed past, headed for the infinity of the past, 12 billion years ago before they had the job of being weeks. They're tired of it and want to go back home to a pillowed galaxy, the homeland and the spheres with no people around to bother them with multifoliate appointments. Odin is welcome to stand there indefinitely with ravens perched on his shoulders and Vallejo to die on a rainy Thursday in Paris after collecting discarded wine bottles to buy bread. Bread alone only makes you hungrier, he said. Thursday is a good day to die, especially if there's a cold rain on Montparnasse. Vallejo wanted to go home to Peru, but couldn't with an empty wallet and a heavy heart. Seeing his soul rise over Paris, up into the rain. We crossed Boulevard Montparnasse and ducked into Le Select, one of Jim's favorite watering holes. Jim wanted a glass of wine and needed to pet Mickey. <laughs> Mickey, the resident cat, a fixture at Select and an old friend of Jim's. I ordered a couple glasses of Cote de Brie. Jim, the moment he spotted Jim, Mickey leapt off his bar stool and sidled up to the table, rubbing himself against Jim's leg. Jim scratched his neck and ears and Mickey lay down at his feet. The day wasn't over. We needed to see it out to complete Jim's pilgrimages with a visit to Père Lachaise. The afternoon had cleared. We encountered very few people and found our way first to the grave of Colette with whose work little Jimmy was infatuated as a teenager and then to the grave of Guillaume Apollinaire. Jim used a line from Apollinaire as an epigraph to his long poem in Interim's Outlier. Let us open together the last bud of the future. 
And then Jim was done. He turned to me reciting Lorca. I want to dream, I want to sleep the dream of the apples to withdraw from the tumult of cemeteries, which we did and had lunch. Let me finish with Jim's poem, Bridge, published in Dead Man's Float. Most of my life was spent building a bridge out over the sea, though the sea was too wide. I'm proud of the bridge hanging in the pure sea air. Machado came for a visit, and we sat on the end of the bridge, which was his idea. Now that I'm old, the work goes slowly. Ever near death, I like it out here, high above the sea bundled up for the Arctic storms of late fall. The resounding crash and moan of the sea, the hundred foot depth of the green troughs. Sometimes the sea roars and howls like the animal it is, a continent wide and alive. What beauty in this, the darkest music, over which you can hear the lightest music of human behavior, the tender connection between man and galaxies. So I sit on the edge, wagging my feet above the abyss. Tonight, the moon will be in my lap. This is my job, to study the universe from my bridge. I have the sky, the sea, the faint green streak of Canadian forest on the far shore. In an interview published in the French literary journal Transfuge, a friend of Jim's, Alex Thilchus, asked Jim, Où voudriez-vous être enterré? Where would you like to be buried? To which Harrison responded, Oh, I don't care. Throw my ashes in a river. Jim's ashes were spread by his family in various undisclosed locations. I suspect water played a significant role. So let us open together the last bud of the future, the pages of Jim, Jim Harrison's immortal complete poems. Nine bows to Joseph, Joyce, Jamie and Anna, Terry, and the blessed memories of Linda and Jim, Russell and Lulu. Thank you. My God, Peter, that was amazing. Um, your friendship with Jim, what a friendship. I would have loved, I would have loved to help hoist Jim out of that, uh, out of that hole in the guy. <laughs> what an incredible thing. Oh God, I just can't imagine it. And uh, I noticed behind you, you have a lot of little, not even little, but you have a lot of uh, accoutrements there. You have books and broadsides, and I'm assuming empty wine bottles from that contain some pretty good memories of uh, times with Jim. So thank you so much for sharing the uh, your insights. And the chat, I got to say, I know that you weren't paying attention to the chat, but the chat was going ballistic. <laughs> All sorts. People are really appreciating the context that you provided uh, those pilgrimages because I think that uh, probably everyone here uh, tonight wants to go on similar pilgrimages uh, and do the search. Um, and such an honor for you to have been there with that search and to help him. So thank you for that, it's glorious. Now our final guest uh, tonight is Amy Hundley uh, who edited Jim's fiction and, and continues to edit Jim's fiction and nonfiction at Grove. Um, Amy also interestingly serves as the editor for the incandescent Roxanne Gay. And I just so admire that editor's brain and soul that can contain the forces of writers as powerful as Roxanne Gay and Jim Harrison. That is amazing. Uh, Jim loved working with Amy. Uh, he wrote poems inspired by her presence. Uh, and Jim dedicated the novel True North to Amy and to her colleague at Grove, Judy Hottinson, who's also here tonight. Hello, Judy. Uh, Amy is currently uh, at work on a collection of Jim's nonfiction that is going to appear in uh, 2022. Uh, Amy, the floor is yours. Um, can you hear me okay? 
Yes, I can. Hear um, you. Good. Uh, well, the, the secret about Jim and Roxanne is that they're both Midwesterners with an affinity for Nebraska. So, <laughs> um, a wise man named Joseph Bednarik once sent me the following quote when I was working on Jim Harrison's memoir, Off to the Side. Um, it's from the Italian born Argentine poet Antonio Porchia. Out of a hundred years, a few minutes were made that stayed with me, not a hundred years. Um, I think at the time it was intended to mollify me for sending me editorial notes on a book in progress, which Jim introduced me to the possibility of by saying that I should pay attention because Joseph was his poultry editor. Um, but I'm choosing to take it now as permission to give you a few stories here that are more like individual beads than a beautiful continuous necklace or a deeply essayistic consideration of Jim's poetry. Uh, it has absolutely nothing to do with what parenting a toddler in a pandemic has done to my brain. Um, one August, about 20 something years ago, um, I got a fax. Um, at the time, our publisher, Morgan Etrigan, who at the time I was assisting um, and who brought Jim to Grove, um, used to spend a month in Greece at the end of every summer. And he was more or less completely incommunicado during that time. Um, I didn't know Jim then and didn't actually know as the new kid that we'd even acquired his work. Um, and in the fax, which was written in Jim's, in my opinion, beautiful longhand, um, he informed Morgan that he um, could not finish his new novel without a new notebook with the finest rag paper. Um, did Morgan have a young nymph who could, he could send out for one? Um, well, I couldn't ask Morgan what to do and I couldn't do nothing. Um, if I knew very little at the time, I knew that Jim was a very big deal. Um, so I took myself to the stationery store and bought him a notebook bound in blue leather and some kind of vaguely floral um, paper overboard and sent it to him at FedEx with a note identifying myself as performing nymph duty. Um, this should make you laugh if you know Jim or at least a sense of humor. Um, he wrote with pilot razor point pens exclusively, sometimes in notebooks, but often just on yellow legal pads. Um, and this kind of demand is, I think it can only have been part joke and part test. Um, the novel that he was working on then was The Road Home, um, which began, it's easy to forget that in the main, we die only seven times more slowly than our dogs. That novel was worth that notebook many times over, whether or not the notebook ever got used, which I doubt. Um, and I guess at the end of that interaction, he decided he liked me. Um, Jim was notorious for his phone calls, his phone messages, which eventually became emails. And a lot of things were a little bit of a test or a, you know, a tweak, a tease. Um, he was horrified that I was at the time a pescatarian. And also that I often eat the same thing for lunch. I have an email from him that says, dear tuna, lots of company. Why is the forest glorious? This was in July. Killed three rattlers in yard while barbecuing wild pig. Two were in the act of love, a little man snake and a big woman snake. Had they reached orgasm before they heard and felt gun? Over the course of a few books, we got into a kind of a groove with each other. Off to the side came a few years later, and that was when he kind of appointed me to edit him. Um, and that was also the first time I met him in person, which was when we brought him to New York for um, Book Expo for that book. Um, and I remember dancing with him at a big loud BEA party. Um, but you know, what a book <laughs> I've given that book to more people than I can remember as has my partner. Um, my friend, Jason, who is listening, who's in the chat, um, told me, uh, today, I think that on reading it, he knew that Jim was a poet. Um, I had gone through a pretty rough breakup with someone a few years after Jim and I met. Um, and it took a little bit of time to shake it off a few years, actually. Um, and he later told my partner that when he wrote The Summer He Didn't Die, um, which we published in 2005, that his lesbian social worker, Gretchen, um, that her painful breakup was based on mine. Um, in 2006 was the first time Jim ever sent me one of his poems. Um, that poem was Barking. Um, he sent it with a testy note about my failure to respond with sufficient alacrity to one of his, um, some of his writing. Um, I fulfilled my contract and I'm 83 pages into my new novel. However, I still feel friendly to you in particular. And there's the expectation someday that you will make me your special tuna sandwich recipe. Read this poem to understand my mood. So this is working. The moon comes up, the moon goes down. This is to inform you that I didn't die young. 
Age swept past me, but I caught up. Spring has begun here, and each day brings new birds up from Mexico. Yesterday, I got a call from the outside world, but I said no in thunder. I was a dog on a short chain, and now there's no chain. In about 2010 was the first time I ever worked with Jim face-to-face. Um, and I took an editing trip out to Arizona. And we're going to show a couple of photos that were taken then. I took them, so I'm not actually in them. Um, but they're of Jim with my partner, Christabel. Um, during that trip was the first time I'd ever worked with Jim in person. We were staying in a hotel of his choosing. Uh, we would get up in the morning. He was very keen about starting on time. We would sometimes find him tapping his foot a little bit when we got there. Um, letting us know who was in charge. And I would sit with him in his study all morning and work with him on the book. And the next room, Christabel would write or read or eavesdrop or whatever. Um, and then we'd break for lunch, which was very important to him. During one of those lunch breaks, um, Christabel was throwing a ball for Jim's Scottish lab, Zilpha, and Zilpha bit Hen's hand. Um, I think at the time uh, he had Zilpha and Mary, who was an English cocker. Um, and Christabel had read off to the side at my insistence when we first met, and it meant a lot to him to meet him. Um, and another thing that happened around that time was um, he was working on um, the novella Games of Night, um, and he wrote me, Dear Amy Muffin, one of the French girls in Reggio should definitely be called Christabel. Take your pick. Um, after lunch, Jim, of course, would take his nap, another topic that he wrote about a lot. Uh, and we'd work a little bit more in the afternoon and then have dinner together. Um, this next picture is when we were on our way out to dinner. Um, I actually think that Cunningham's Ranch House restaurant, which is not where we went, but I was I was trying to figure out where we did go. I was Googling earlier, earlier and, um, but that ranch house unfortunately has burned down since then a few years ago. Um, but we went to the Vineyard Cafe and um, we obviously, drank a lot, ate a lot of wonderful food, um, talked until very late. And the next morning we're rolling in for work, a little bit bleary eyed. And Jim came downstairs um, proudly with the manuscript of a poem called Love. Love is as raw as freshly cut meat, mean as a beetle on the track of dung. It is the Celtic dog that ate its tail in a dream. It chooses us as a blizzard chooses a mountain. It's seven knocks on the door you pray not to answer. The boy followed the girl to school, eating his heart with each step. He wished to dance with her beside a lake, the wind showing the leaves, silvery undersides. She held the moist bouquet of wild violets he had picked against her neck. She wore the she wore the sun like her skin, but beneath her blood was black as soil. At the grave of her dog in the woods, she told him to please go away forever. It was around 2006 that I made the cut to be on the list of what Jim called his poetry friends. Um, he sent his poetry out to a group of trusted friends, more or less as he wrote it, I think. Um, so I saw quite a few of his poems from then on. Um, as they were being written, probably not all of them. Um, but it, that was about eight years after that first contact with Jim. It, was, um, it meant a lot to me to be included in that. Um, in my two editing trips with Jim, the one thing that really impressed itself on me was how deep and solid and bedrock was his relationship with his wife, Linda. That was something he kept very private for himself. Um, I knew Linda, obviously, on the phone before I met her in person. Um, but he didn't talk about her much in interviews. He didn't bring her on the road. She came to New York for reasons of her own, but not for publishing reasons. Um, meeting her, a whole other world opened up to me and it became clear to me how much the image of the lone writer was just that. It was something he constructed in the same way that he put on a public self for a reading. Um, and while I wouldn't presume to say what anyone else's real self is, the real life he shared with Linda and Jamie and Anna were very much his anchor and his gravity. Um, and um, in the process of editing Search for the Genuine, uh, which is the collected nonfiction that Joseph mentioned, which draws from his very early career in about 1970 to right before he died, 
Um, we've been pulling together some very beautiful photos of Jim and that one of Jim and Linda is one that I believe was taken in London by Dan Gerber. I love how it captures the passion of their young love and the real connection between the two of them. It's it very evident to me. Um, this is a poem that I think of. Um, older love. His wife has asthma, so he only smokes outdoors or late at night with head and shoulders well into the fireplace, the mesquite and oak heat bright against his face. Does it replace the heat that has wandered from love back into the natural world? But then the shadow passion casts is much longer than passion, stretching with effort from year to year. Outside tonight, hard wind and sleet from three bald mountains, and on the hearth before his face, the ashes will all become soft as the back of a woman's knee. The last time I saw Jim was in May 2015 in Montana. Um, we were working on the ancient minstrel and one day after we finished work for the day, we were sitting in his front yard. He had a picnic table in the front yard and we heard a gasp. One of his daughters, I think Anna, was smoking surreptitiously around the back of the house and there was a huge <laughs> rattlesnake. Um, Jim got up and they went to get the gun. Uh, but it was Linda who actually finished off the rattlesnake because... As elegant as she was, Linda was also what my generation calls a badass. Um, and if you've seen a dead rattlesnake, they don't actually die all that quickly. They kind of keep moving around. <laughs> um, I think it was Jamie, but it may have been Jim who asked me if I wanted them out. So I held the rattlesnake down with a shovel behind its head because even if they're dead, they can still strike you and they can still poison you. Um, and Jamie very queasily sawed off the rattle, which is All right, this is one last missive from Jim. I have a feeling I may have a number of unknown diseases to which there are no symptoms. I'm scheduled for approximately 33 stops while touring US and Canada and France in September. Since these are free and I ordinarily get $7,000 for a reading, you owe me $231,000. I will waive this if you all try to be nicer. Like Lorca, I'm only the pulse of a wound that probes to the opposite side. I admit that other publishing houses that have wanted me are full of ghastly people with one whom with whom one would hesitate to share a cinnamon bun. Regarding birds, this morning I joined a familiar flycatcher who was watching a heron couple build a nest. Uh, the last poem I want to share um, is one of his last poems. Um, it's from Dead Man's Float, and it's called The Sacred Art of Log Sitting. Um, as Joseph has said, it's something he wrote about a lot. It was kind of his way of greeting the day and the land. Um, it is a meditation practice and it also returns us to self. So this is, it's a long poem. So I'm gonna just give you a few little bit. I want to walk in the morning with Zilpha again. I want to walk in the morning with Zilpha again. I want to walk in the morning with Zilpha again, amen. And I want a bird hunt, which I've done with intensity for 40 years in a row. Is this even possible? The answer, come to find out, was that I couldn't keep up. Zilpha would flush some birds and look to me, wondering why I hadn't shot. I was far behind, sitting on an emery oak log and staring hard at the landscape. So I decided to make some notes on the sacred art of long sitting, log sitting. Approach the log cautiously with proper reverence, as if you were entering a French cathedral or the bedroom of your lover. If it's over 60 degrees, inspect the lower sides of the log for Mojave rattlesnakes. Now, examine the log closely for the most comfortable place to sit, usually away from the sun. Sit down. Empty your mind of everything except what is in front of you, the natural landscape of the canyon. Dismiss or allow to slide away any aspect of your grand or pathetic life. Breathe slowly. Avoid a doze. Internalize what you see in the canyon, the oaks and mesquites, the rumpled and grassy earth, hawks flying by, a few songbirds. Stay put for 45 minutes to an hour. When you get up, bite, bow nine times to the log. Three logs a day is generally my maximum. I can readily imagine buying a small ranch I'd call the log ranch. I'd truck in 33 logs and arrange them on the property like the Stations of the Cross. This could soothe me during my limited time in the 21st century, which has been very coarse indeed, especially after Zilpha died. Thank you.
Amy, thank you so much. Oh my goodness, what fantastic, what fantastic stories. <laughs> I love the story of the rattlesnake. Uh, and so you got the rattle actually for us or is it a, oh my God, that's fantastic. Well, it's one of the great uh, literary totems of, uh, <laughs> of American letters. Oh my God, that's fantastic. And Jamie, thank you. you hear it? Oh my God, everyone here tonight is blessed with the rattle of a rattlesnake. Yeah, do it one more time, Amy. That's just, oh God, that's utterly fantastic. Um, we have uh, actually come to the close of our event. We had intended to have a, a Q and A session, but we ran a little long. Uh, we wanna honor everyone's presence. Um, and honor the time. Uh, we also want to thank uh, our participants, John Freeman, Peter Lewis, and Amy Hundley. That was just so extraordinary. Um, and I also want to thank the hundreds and hundreds of Heartsworth donors who have helped make this book possible. Uh, as mentioned, we are continuing our efforts to secure and advance Jim's reputation as a great American poet. And if this evening doesn't prove anything, it, well, if it proves something, it proves that, my God, Jim Harrison is a great American poet. Uh, I invite you to press the link in the chat section to become a donor of the heart's work. We're going to keep this project going, and we would love to have you uh, be a part of it. So actually, you know what I'm thinking, for those people who need to leave, you got to do dinner, you got to go to bed, you got to do something, you are welcome to leave. If John, Amy, and Peter, if you could hang out for just a little bit, I would like to actually have a, now that I think about it, would like to have a little conversation, um, but we will allow those who need to need to go, go. Um, I have to call out a comment from the chat from my dear oh, friend, Lauren. Oh, fantastic. Can we all agree though, that Jim would not have approved of Zoom? <laughs> and yeah, I, agreed. I, no, I yeah. absolutely can. <laughs> Yeah, I cannot imagine a Zoom call. Um, Peter, I also want to just say thank you for having the courage to uh, break out your Jim Harrison imitation. That was uh, a very, very powerful rendition. <laughs> thank you for permitting me such a liberty on this occasion. Right on. So um, I was curious. And so, Peter, you first met Jim in Montana. Can you tell a story? Tell us a little bit more about that. I met Jim at the stove of Richard Brodigan's kitchen. Wow. Every mid, late summer to fall, I was, I, was, I was at Richard's for probably, I don't know, three months maybe. Every summer and fall, the boys would gather to go hunting and fishing. Russell was there painting. Russell Shadow, yeah. Uh, Guy would fly in and... Uh, they would gather to fish and hunt. And Richard had a ranch house on, in Pine Creek, sort of across the, the Yellowstone from where Russ had his cabin at the time and a studio, painting studio. And I was, uh, I was Richard's, I, I called myself his lackey. I, you know, I, I ran errands, I did his shopping, I vacuumed, I did dishes. And, and uh, one day I was in the kitchen, I was cooking. And Jim Harrison, whose books I had seen at Saxon Friar, but had never met, walks into the kitchen. And of course, the first question out of his mouth was, what are you cooking? And I said, split pea soup. And he said, can I taste it? And I took a spoon and I gave him a taste. And he said, that's very good. It reminds me of my mom's. Mm -hmm. And I took that as a kid from the Midwest. I mean, he was from the upper Midwest. I was born and raised in Chicago. I took that as a very high compliment. That's, that's how Jim and I met. That's fantastic. For, uh, appropriately, over the stove, sharing food, and just enjoying the moment. Right on. That's fantastic. And Amy, I'm just curious in terms of your work, your editing relationship with Jim, when you were working at, you would go to Arizona or Montana. How did you handle the secondhand smoke? Did you? Oh, I just bathed it in. 
just take in the ambiance. So yeah. what, I mean, can you describe uh, like a day working with him? I mean, how, so once you got into the office, you described it before the preparations, but once you got into the office, how, what was that process like? Well, I mean, as you know, Jim did not use a computer. Right. Um, and he didn't even really, I mean, he, he edited kind of in by hand. So it was much faster for me to sit there with my computer and like kind of talk everything through with him. So I would read him a passage and I would, you know, make my comments and then um, we would, we would negotiate <laughs> what it should read. And then I would read it back to him. I'd type it in and read it back to him. Right. So you're actually typing during that time? You're on yeah. a Wow. So my computer also had second hands. Wow. That's impressive. That is great. And John, moving over to you, I would just like to ask you a question. So, you know, as I said earlier, you're the only person here who hadn't, you know, physically been in the same space as Jim, but somehow I feel like you have this really rich, deep relationship um, with him. I would love to find out your process, especially in reading. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a quite a task to read the body of work. I'm a task. I mean, it's a joyful task, but reading the body of work. And I'm just curious, like, what was that process to watch his work unfold over uh, 50 years in a concentrated reading session? Actually, I, um, you were very, you very kindly sent me all the books um, well enough in advance that I could, I could live with them. You know, the, the, the books are, the, the span of work is so impressive um, because he, although he had themes that he came back to and images he came back to, he doesn't really repeat himself. Hmm. There's this immense variety within dailiness that you feel within his work. And the books are different. Dead Man's Float is very different from, you know, the, the, the books which precede it. Um, and so you, you feel you're like you're on this journey with him. Um, and there's a, there's this, you know, it's not like a parked car in an overnight church parking lot, <laughs> you know, cold to the touch. His work is always warm always you know when you when you pick it up and that that to me means it will it will stay and you know these and i i i think um something that um amy and peter both mentioned was his sort of deep sensual appreciation for not just living um but for the world itself and it's ten thousand things and you know, we live in such a um, a country kind of haunted by its um, its its uh, starchy Christian um, <laughs> beginnings in in the in its colonial era, um, and I think Jim is a repairer mm. uh, to some degree. He repairs us to ourselves um, and and permits us through this exquisite ability to inhabit the senses. It's not gluttonous. It's it's completely opposite. It's it's something kind of whole. It's it's a holy appreciation for aliveness, um, because the you know the, the many religious traditions teach us that the flesh is 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 bad. It's our problem that it that our bodies are are already fallen. And and he manages to um, over the course of all those books, and it's magical to watch it. He he. Um, he sort of, without even appearing to try to, he David Blaine's his way out of original sin. Mm. Um, and I just, <laughs> I, I love that. I love watching that. Um, it's, it's, it's something we, I think we continuously need um, being in this strange, you know, body that we, we all are born into. Um, uh, it, it, it's a, he invites us back into it and to enjoy it. And that's, that's a gift bigger than I think almost any poet can give you. Wow. Thank you, John. One final question just for everybody. Just, I would be curious to know if there is a, a line or a poem that you carry with you that you think about with some frequency that you return to uh, in, in any of the books other than some, well, maybe it's something that you read tonight. Um, but I'm just curious what lines come up for you, Amy? 
this is like a little bit less high minded, but it, I actually had it as my email signature for a while and it's too long for me to remember the whole thing, but it was something about like, it was about New York city. And Jim had, of course, a great love hate relationship with New York city. He found it very energizing and also like it really over, I think it really overstimulated him and he couldn't wait to get away. Um, mm. And it was something about like how New York, the skins of buildings were like the, um, like an, the layers of an onion. Mm. Um, and the, and the way that, it, that, that the passage ended was when you see a girl walking by with nine goofy dogs on tethers, you start to think that maybe these people know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. John, do you have any poem or line that, um, Amy, you know? Amy read it, um, passions, uh, what is it? The, 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 sh- the passion's shadow is long is longer than passion from older love. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. That's just, it's a, it's a universe in that line. Right. That's fantastic. And Peter, we'll close with you. All the friend here. You know, I, I can't say that there's a line. What I, what I tend to do, I have always one of Jim's books on my nightstand hmm. and I open the book and then I, I can't stop reading, hmm. you know? And, and so it's, they're very close to me. I mean, in, in terms of books, I, I think the two that I return to most frequently are Letters to the Assignment, yeah. because as a sequence, I think it's just one of the most profound, longer format poetic statements, uh, you know, in my lifetime, in my reading lifetime, let me put it that way more honest and you know i um dead man's float in in part because they were until this volume was published the last poetic statement that we had from jim uh draws me back endlessly and 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 once i start i i just can't uh, i can't finish with reading a single poem it, the, the collection as a collection is, is profound. I loved in preparing for this, going back to earlier books and, and um, saving daylight, re- rediscovering as it were, saving daylight was uh, a, an amazing, truly an amazing experience. Right. I, I can't isolate a single poem or a single line. It's No, that's fantastic. Interesting, just to kind of, uh, close with uh, echoing off of what Amy was talking about. Saving Daylight was the first time that Jim and I worked together in uh, in, a, in an enclosed space where I also had to take in the secondhand smoke. And I remember we were, he was trying to figure out the title for that book. And he said, how about Saving the Daylight? And then I said, how about Saving Daylight? And he just goes, better. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> there you go. So anyway. uh, yeah, I was going to I was going to say, Joseph, you're not getting out of here without talking about editing Jim yourself. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, there's my little. Well, I mean, well, OK, I will I will throw this in uh, one of the absolute joys and highlights of my publishing career. Um, we would gather together poems. I was, I was on the, the poetry list, so they would come in and the file would grow. Um, and when the file got sufficiently hefty, he'd call or write and say, I think it's about time we get together. Um, and then Joyce would arrange for me to go to either Montana or Arizona, and we'd spend two days together with those sheaf of poems. Um, I would, of course, have read all of them very deeply in preparation, um, doing line edits, etc. And we'd get there. And uh, so I was like completely uh, immersed in whatever manuscript we were working on. And we would go through the first day deciding uh, what poems were in or out. And I knew when that process was happening, anytime I asked an out, it would be, or suggest an out, he would say, why? And so I would have to have my reasons made up um, and articulate those. Uh, After that process was done, we would go through and do line edits. Um, And again, the same thing, I would have to have very uh, good reasons why I was making the choices I was or suggesting the choices I was suggesting. Cause that's one thing I told Jim, I said, you're the artist, you know, <laughs> I literally am just your last best 
reader before you go public with these. So you're, it's, they're all your choices, you know? Um, and the one thing that um, I think that we, uh, or the, one of the reasons I got into the room is because I cared so deeply about the work and that's really all I cared about. Um, that when I left Arizona or Montana, that we had the best book that we possibly could have. Uh, and that's was the entire deal. Um, and so like you, arrive early in the morning, work in the morning, have break for lunch, have a nap, maybe do a double, sh you know, work in the afternoon, out to dinner. <laughs> it would always be like, I want you here tomorrow at 7.07. .07. And I'd literally arrive at 7.05 .07 and wait till 7.07, .07, knock on the door and he'd open it up. He's like, you're late. It's like, oh, <laughs> I don't call it, Jim. And uh, so, but you know, I would, again, the, the greatest, honor of my publishing career is is doing that close work um and i i love doing the work and i love jim harrison so joseph would you permit me to tell one very brief story sure i'll try to keep this very short i want to tell the story of the first time that i met joseph oh yikes jim and i were in portland oregon oh, God. Uh, he was there to do Portland Arts and Lectures. If you one committed to Seattle Arts and Lectures, it involved going to Portland to do Portland Arts and Lectures. And Jim said, while we're here, we have to have lunch with this friend of mine, Joseph Bednarik. And we met at that little Italian restaurant over in Southeast Portland. And who, yeah, I think you were working for uh, working with Story. Roger, right, at the time? Storyline, yep. Yeah. And when I was, when years later, after we met you, and but he had, uh, he already had so much respect for you mm. and, and trusted you. Mm. And the prospect of your taking on this position at Copper Canyon, when, when he asked me, should I make this move? Shall I, shall I come to Copper Canyon? I, I, I said, here's the thing. Sam Hamill wants you to come. I want you to come. But you're going to have Joseph Bednarik as your editor. I promise you that Joseph Bednarik will be your editor at Copper Canyon. And I think that that really, I think that sealed the deal. Because as you and Amy both know, that relationship between writer and editor is such a critical relationship. And that's how much he trusted you, how much he trusted Amy, certainly. And I just want to pay tribute. You're moderating, so I'm taking a liberty, but I want to pay tribute to the very special relationships that each of you had with Jim, because you are the, the, the midwife and uh, what, uh, mid-husband? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take Harrison's that, nice. Poetry and prose fiction delivered to the world. And, and we're so indebted to you both. Oh, thanks, Peter. I'll just close out that, that quick Genoa story. I actually went to that restaurant as a vegetarian. The first thing, <laughs> it, was, it was, I recall the restaurant, both my wife was seven months pregnant and we called the restaurant prior and said, you know, what are your vegetarian options? And there was this long silence on the phone and they said, uh, it's a prefix menu there. Uh, we need 24 hours advance notice if we're going to do vegetarian. I'm like, ah. <laughs> so, so I told, I told my wife, I said, you know what? We'll just eat around the meat. <laughs> <laughs> there was no way you could eat around the meat at that meal. So Jim, all, every time we got together, Jim loved that story because he said, you know, Joseph, I love how you can jump over the wall. And, uh, and then I said, Jim, but I never jump back. Yeah. <laughs> That's anyway. great. Yeah. Well, guys, this has been an amazing evening. I am so happy to have been here. And I truly, I, there is no place I would much rather, I would rather be than right here. Um, so thank you for spending uh, this time with us. Thank you very much for your advocacy of Jim's work and uh, the complete poems. And uh, I, I wish you the best. Blessings to all of you. It's a beautiful, beautiful book, Joseph. Thank you should be very, very proud. Thank Truly. you so much for asking me to participate. Uh, my, my great joy. And uh, thank me and thank all of our hearts work buddies. You. You're amazing. Thank you.
All thank right. you so much. Thank and thanks to all the staff at Copper Canyon for us. I will. Thanks I will. For, thanks for. Great.